Hello, Eric Clark here. This is lecture M6.6, how the internet has changed communication online. This lecture applies to students at Dublin, Bahrain and Penang. Before I get into the lecture, I would just like to apologise if there's any background noise. There's nothing much I can do about that. Uh, the office I am using is facing onto a construction site here in Dublin. Uh, on the York Street campus. So apologies. Hopefully it won't be too bad. So for this lecture the learning outcomes are as follows. To understand the impact the internet has had on patient communities. To understand the principle of open access patient data. To understand the issues regarding the quality of data on the internet to understand the impact of the internet on medical education. As part of this lecture, there are four papers to read. And I'd like to stress to students, and some students can get a little anxious about this, there's no need to be able to recite or uh, rewrite these papers. What I'm after is that students read them all and gain an understanding of the core concepts. The first of these um, papers comes from the Journal of the American Medical Association, but the medical student version of that journal. Very often journals will have uh, a medical student version. And the paper is entitled, The Internet Ushering in a New Era in Medicine. Now, the article appeared in April 2001, which for a lot of us and certainly for you is nearly a full lifetime ago but that doesn't necessarily mean that the paper is out of date and I'd like you to consider the basic points made in it um, and while you're reading this paper think about how you use the internet or how you may have used the internet when you or somebody you know has been sick, where something has come up in your life where you've thought to yourself, I don't know enough about this health-related topic, and you've used the internet to research it. So read the paper and think about those that aspect of uh, your life, what you may have done. The second paper is from the BMJ, the British Medical Journal, a well-regarded uh, and trusted peer-reviewed journal and the article entitled How Google is Changing Medicine. And I think as you read it, you could uh, replace the word Google with search engine or just information generally available on the internet. Again, this is not a hugely scientific paper, uh, but I would like students to understand the basic principles. And here we have something that is a, bit, a little bit more quantitative. Googling for a diagnosis, again from the BMJ, the British Medical Journal, the use of Google as a diagnostic aid, an internet-based study. So please read that also. And then finally, this article is about our information technology in medical education. And this is an easy read for most people because I think uh, we could apply it pretty much anywhere and you may already have experience of learning online or e-learning as people like to call it in your previous school or college. But before we get into this let's just take a look at something I clipped from the web about a year ago. Uh, it's, a, it's an announcement from Google via the, one of their blogs. Uh, a big announcement where they announced a service called Calico. A new company focused on health and well-being. There's two great words put together. Health and well-being. And it says, and forgive me for reading it, Google today announced Calico, a new company that will focus on health and well-being and in particular the challenge of aging and associated diseases. That's very noble and who could argue with that? That's a good idea. Uh, and here it says, announcing this new investment that's an investment. So uh, what are Google about? And like any company, 
I'm not saying this is a bad thing. They're about profits. They're about money. Um, they will have some altruism, but it's a business. It needs to have a business model. And it has the full weight of, weight of Larry Page, one of the co-founders of Google. And he says, illness and aging affect all our families. With some longer term moonshot thinking uh, around healthcare and biotechnology, I believe we can improve millions of lives. Well, there's a lot in those couple of words. Illness and aging affect all our families. Absolutely correct. Who could argue with that? And a very uh, modern phrase, if you like, with some longer term moonshot thinking. Uh, you know, we've got to think big. We've got to think beyond the moon. Um, and Larry Page says he believes we can improve millions of lives. And again, who could argue with that? What a great idea. And he says it's impossible to imagine that anybody... Uh, anyone better than Art, and this is this chap, Arthur Levinson, who has taken the job, uh, one of the leading scientists and entrepreneurs of our generation, to take this venture forward. So, um, a big, big new push by Google. Well, it was a year ago. Uh, and in that year, we've seen the development of apps, for smartphones that will monitor heart rate, all that kind of thing. So this is a huge area. A lot of what we're seeing in the last year is about the generation of data for personal use. So you're going to track your own heart rate, blood sugar, wherever it may be. So there's information that's generated by the user for use by the user or information that is out there to inform about disease or to support the diagnosis. So there's a lot going on here, and the two don't necessarily mix. But for now, let's concentrate on these five areas. Firstly, the internet and medicine, how we build communities for patients with rare diseases. Now, I've used the word rare there, but uh, it not, not, that's not necessarily the case. Just patients with the disease. I want to look specifically at the National Library of Medicine, their website for physicians and patients. Two, two very different websites there. Um, the issue of uh, access versus quality assurance. Lots of information out there easily got at, but not very good quality in some cases. Or what is the quality control? Uh, what skills do people need to access this information? Not a huge problem. It certainly was uh, some years ago. It is diminishing. There is still a socio-economic impact here that if people are from households with less money, they will have less access to technology. That's a social reality. And then medical education and the internet, this changes everything. How you're actually learning, you listen to me now, uh, you will be Googling lots of information. You will be, even the fact I've used the word Googling says a lot about what's changed. You'll be using Moodle to get information. You will have lots of different sources out there. So we could break these five concepts and give them one word each. How we communicate, how we reference, how do we find good quality information, reference to quality, it follows. Then what skills we need to find this information and how do we educate ourselves and our patients around this whole entire area. So let's look at this first issue about building a community for patients. The internet has without doubt transformed the definition of community for the patient with a disease. Uh, social media, websites, bulletin boards, chat room, you name it, YouTube videos, uh, there's lots of it aimed specifically at patients. Put in any search term, it will give you text, images, video, where do you want to go? And there is plenty of information out there. Now, just because you can search for it doesn't necessarily mean it's a community. You could consider the whole internet to be a community, but it's vast. It's far too big. And what we have is patients can gather together online uh, to find a place to voice their feelings of alienation, bewilderment, and apprehension. And they're very powerful words. And the reason I've used them is that remember when patients 
are first diagnosed with a serious condition or serious disease, uh, this is generally the feeling they may have. Uh, I feel different. Why me? And what on earth is going to happen to me next? So the sense of community and belonging is really vital. So this is my friend Susan. Um, and of course I have Sue's consent to use and to talk about her. So my friend Sue was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2005. It's a long time ago, nine years. And Sue uh, has lived with this condition uh, since that initial very frightening diagnosis, which happened a short time after she got married. But Sue is not the type of person to sit around and do nothing. Sue is a doer. Sue makes things happen. Sue is sometimes the loudest voice in the room with reason. Sue will not take the status quo. Sue questions things, all good qualities. And Sue decided that she had something to offer in the context of her diagnosis around breast cancer. And what she decided she had to offer was uh, positivity. So Sue collected positive stories about cancer and cancer treatment to help other patients stay hopeful and a positive mental attitude is absolutely vital when patients are approaching an important or life-changing event now it can't, doesn't always uh, patients don't always stay positive obviously but that's where Sue was coming from she decided that she was going to publish a book which she did uh, positive stories and Sue just didn't print one or two or ten copies or a hundred copies she printed 10,000 copies uh, fundraised and got upwards of 30,000 euros and has bought equipment equipment for the hospital uh, oncology department it's in James's which is here in the center of Dublin and has also made sure that as many people as possible have got copies of her book quite a miraculous story for one individual uh, who has made a considerable difference to uh, cancer sufferers in this country and abroad and sue is media savvy sue has had several jobs she knows the way the world works so she got on facebook uh, sue went on radio sue went on television and sue promoted her agenda which was to help other people stay positive. And that's precisely what she did. If we take this to a more formal level, uh, of course, this is nothing new. Here is uh, Breast Cancer Ireland's website. Their tagline is researching a cure. They want to help people. And look at what's going on here. Become a volunteer, get involved. Here are the facts about breast cancer. This is not aimed at healthcare professionals. Oh, healthcare professionals will use it. This is aimed at people in society who wish to get involved. It's fundraising. Uh, it is important. Uh, it is the first face of their breast cancer campaign. And nothing new in it. But there is their presence. We go into Twitter now, and we just say there's are the Irish Cancer Society. Uh, so they have linked with um, Breast Cancer Ireland because October is a uh, the month where uh, breast cancer awareness is promoted. Uh, and we have look at those numbers there: eight thousand tweets, twenty thousand people following. Uh, 24,000 followers um, following 20,000 so that this is a hugely vast and complex community built up just by Twitter uh, so there's two things there we have the breast cancer and of course breast cancer is now linking with uh, the Irish Cancer Society's Twitter feed so the information is getting further afield uh, so what's going on let's think about this when uh, patients are no longer limited to what was essentially a face-to-face -face interaction uh, or a, a helpline where people could call up or they would write and get support 
This may sound alien or foreign or uh, like another age to some of you, but that's pretty much where what patients were limited to. They didn't see anybody or talk to anybody in some cases until they went to the hospital or the clinic where they were being treated. Once they left that setting, uh, they were on their own or just with their families. There were no other uh, people with the same condition um, around them, unless, of course, they live close to one. So it was kind of isolating. And with the internet, uh, members of neglected and vulnerable population. Now, that's really important. I'm not using those terms negatively. Uh, but as people move out of the hospital setting or their clinics, and they can feel a little neglected, despite every effort of the healthcare profession to look after them, to reach out to them. Uh, but certainly, uh, these people are vulnerable. We will all be vulnerable at some stage because of our health. And now at our fingertips, we have the tools necessary to maybe relieve those fears or to answer questions. But of course, that's a big ask. We have an immensely powerful tool. Uh, it, for communication and uh, education, we can disseminate accurate information and current, more to the point, uh, and to help patient empowerment. So this is a really good way of getting up-to-date, consistent, good quality information out into people's hands where they need to see it. Uh, and we can do it 24-7. We can go across time zones, if somebody's up at four in the morning and they can't sleep, they can read what we do at, at whatever on their phone. It doesn't matter. And although we're all used to this 24-7 information, this is really vital for patients. Now, the issue, of course, from your perspective, as you progress through the course, you graduate, you uh, develop your own uh, practice, you're going to be busy. And one of the main uh, complaints uh, people have about healthcare in general is that just the time. This is both patients and uh, professionals. There is enough time. You can't spend three hours talking to one patient. It doesn't happen. Clinics are busy. So with this pressure of time, there can be gaps in communication between the physician or the patient. And support groups for patients with diseases can compensate for this a lack of education and provide these support services. So you can imagine that somebody has uh, been with a physician, they have had some very new information, new terminology, new phrases, and the support group can then, uh, they can ask questions and fill in that. And this we have, what we have, websites, apps, social media, whatever it might be, uh, serve as a valuable channel for communication, share practical ideas, uh, for example, diet, exercise, um, uh, rest regimes, um, all those kind of things. In many cases, uh, comfortable clothing to wear, uh, friendly places to visit for somebody who may be uh, suffering or needs more time. Uh, there are lots of lots of these practical ideas going on. People who've done this before, providing emotional support and comparison of the treatment. How did that go for you? How did you feel? What did you do? That kind of thing. And that level of support is hugely important. And as I say, this complex information can be uh, su supplied by physicians, can be made simpler and more understandable, but there are pitfalls. And we're looking, this is great, we can push out information to patients, but the pitfalls are critical. And the one main issue is cost. And you may say that Twitter and Facebook and uh, setting up a WordPress website is free, but cost is also time. And there is a high demand on time if you're going to keep information current. And very much now these days, if we see a big social media campaign around breast awareness, breast cancer awareness, wherever it may be, there are a team of people behind this making sure that the information is up to date. This doesn't happen uh, generally without dedicated time. And you do get a lot of patients who will dedicate a lot of time, like Sue. Uh, when she was ill, she couldn't work. So this is how she uh, spent her time. 
we have an issue of privacy. As a healthcare professional, there's absolutely no way you can discuss another person's medical record. Um, there are all sorts of issues about how people should behave about their own personal privacy. And some people can treat that differently themselves. And then the fraudulent aspect where somebody, and it happens all the time again, may log on to the website or uh, turn up on the web developer profile and they are not who they say they are. So these issues of cost, and time, privacy and fraudulent behaviour all need constant attention. And that attention means somebody's time, as I say. So we can't, uh, as I say, expect these things just to run on their own. And then that brings us to the issue of what is good information. So let's think about that in these terms. Your patients will go to Google. Most of them will. But where do they go? And of course we don't have an answer to that because there are so many of these things out there. Uh, a patient walks into your office, physiotherapy, medicine, whatever you're doing, and they have a big sheaf of paper, computer printout from the internet. They've spent the previous evening surfing the internet for the latest information about a particular disease. And most patients these days will be prepared. They'll have questions. Uh, advice given to patients is write your questions, make sure you get answers for what it is. No, not all, but you know, what a good strategy. Make sure that the consultation works for you. But it's also possible, is it not, that the patient has brought, uh, not brought, yeah, brought poor quality information. I nearly used the word bought there as in purchased. But so they haven't purchased it, they've just downloaded it and printed it. So you, as a healthcare professional you need to be able to handle that. It might be a small part of the diagnosis, but you can't dismiss it. You can't say, you know, don't look on the internet, only listen to me, because the patient will have invested a lot of time in this. So let's look at just one of those sources and how that maps out. Um, there are others, but let's just look at one. And this is American. Uh, Specifically, uh, there are, as I said, many, many others, uh, and particularly other good sites in all countries in the world, but this one it just happens to be American. So what we're looking at is the National Library of Medicine. So very quickly, what is it? This is the United States National Library of Medicine, operated by the United States federal government, and it is the world's largest medical library. Uh, so the funding comes from the American government um, and in nearly all cases everything they produced is make, made freely available on the internet. But one of the key services they provide is they index uh, their collection. So they have millions of books, journals, technical reports, manuscripts, microfilms, photographs, a, a bewildering array, array of information, uh, including some very old and fascinating rare books that you can search and look up but for now and to keep this in terms of what we're trying to cover today we're looking uh, at two services they provide PubMed and Medli Medline Plus so what's Medline? Medline is the medical literature analysis and retrieval system online and it is an international literature database of life sciences and biomedical information. Quite a mouthful. What does that all mean? Well, first and foremost, it's aimed at the medical, sorry, the healthcare profession. This is not a service um, really aimed at patients, although patients may access it. This is freely available information um, aimed at healthcare professionals and it covers medicine, nursing, pharmacy, dentistry, veterinary medicine and general health care. So pretty much what it does is it masses uh, an index of all the literature um, and uh, publishes that. So if you were to search the current research, the current published information on any topic in the healthcare sphere, Medline is a good place to start. Uh, and as I said, National Library of Medicine, 
produces Medline and makes it freely available. Uh, those of you who are interested in actually an initiative uh, forefronted by Al Gore, who was a presidential candidate at one stage in the United States, and Al Gore figured that if it was paid for by tax dollars, it should be made available. And it is an enormously important resource to the healthcare community. Now, Medline is the collection, and we search it via something called PubMed. And here is PubMed. You put PubMed, those two phrases, PubMed and Medline, can be used interchangeably, but PubMed is how it's branded. And here's a screen grab, and it has 24 million citations of literature. Uh, you may have seen an earlier screen grab where I was looking at patient use of the internet. I had Google, Google Scholar, and then PubMed. So you can filter very quickly down to information. But remember, this information is aimed at healthcare professionals. Freely available, but aimed at the healthcare community. When we get into the patient arena, we're looking at Medline Plus. And this is a website containing health information from the National Library of Medicine, and it is uh, used by healthcare providers and patients. And it is designed to provide up-to-date and authoritative information to both communities. And we have a screen grab in a second, you'll see uh, it looks very different to PubMed. So what happens is that information comes from the US National Institutes of Health and other federal agencies, professional associations, and non-profit organizations. This is not about making money, it's freely available. And it's not only a good source of information for patients, but it's a good place to start because it will give links to other information services. And let's take a look. I've just taken this screen grab um, and see how it's laid out. A service of the National Library of Medicine, well done, that's great. Because of the demographic in the United States, it's also available in Spanish, the second most popular language in the United States. But look here, want to protect yourself and your family, so this is very much uh, something that's aimed at the, uh, the non-healthcare professional. The US government is obviously promoting uh, flu vaccination, I suspect, at the, just at this moment in time. Uh, it is very uh, laid, it's very clear, it's very bright health topics. There will be a list, what people are searching for, popular searches, you could put in a medical phrase there. It gives you a very good definition. Uh, if people are taking supplements or taking a specific drug, they can get information. Uh, there you see they've divided about your health, back pain, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, depression, uh, and then seniors, I suppose that means people over 65, men, women, children. So they've divided the site up into what they think their target audience are, what they know, I'm sure they've done a lot of research. And then the health news today on the 29th of September. Um, many kids, and again, look at that language they're using, not children, kids, it's very much uh, informal language. Many kids with ADHD may be missing out on talk therapy, whatever that may be. Nearly 5% of young US women have chlamydia. So there is a, that's from CDC, that's the Center for Disease Control, another good reference point. So this is pushing out high quality information and then finally look at this videos and cool tools again informal language very much aimed at the healthcare consumer um, so what they do how the the medline plus collect their information is really crucial uh, to understand uh, they select sites that have the following criteria they're educational uh, first and foremost uh, and the criteria of that is they're appropriate to the audience. They're pitched correctly to the uh, non-technical healthcare consumer, if you like. Um, they're well organized and easy to use. That's quite simple. They have an editorial board uh, that makes this decision. Uh, and they are non-commercial. This is not profit-driven. That's what they want to keep away from. That's uh, if you have indigestion, 
indigestion, you should take this medication. That's not where they're coming from. Uh, they will provide evidence of which may be the best um, medication, but not uh, a promotion to a certain type of medication. And specifically, this adds up to something that is dependable. So the website needs to be dependable. And one of their other criteria is that there is a list of authors for that website. So good quality information, well organized, well laid out, easy to use, non-commercial, with named individuals who are promoting it. And although this seems a little uh, abstract, the site must be consistently available. The site's no good if it's down one day a week or disappears and we don't know when it's coming back. It needs to be there all the time and have an established presence. And finally, and this is always a good indication of a reliable website, where they have links to external services not related to themselves, how reliable and well maintained are those links? If a website has lots of links and they're broken, somebody isn't doing their job. So uh, that's one of those criteria. And we'll have another lecture at some stage uh, in the near future about evaluating websites and how to make a quick decision uh, or apply some criteria on how you might uh, evaluate any website you come across. So other content you may come across uh, on Medline, Medline Plus, uh, but specifically Medline. It also uh, allows users to use medical dictionaries, as I've hinted at. And these are good sources, not just a Wikipedia dictionary, but a medical dictionary. And there are some very good ones out there, maintained and up to date. Uh, they will also connect users with hospitals. But of course, it's maybe just based in the United States, so it's not your area. But if you are working in Bahrain or Penang or Dublin, you will know or should know where these services are provided. It also provides directories of named physicians and dentists. Again, that would be directly linked to the area. Uh, extensive medical encyclopedias for more information and consumer information about thousands of prescription drugs and that would be a lot of the information published by drug companies and made available in those tiny, tiny printed sheets that you get with the drugs. So this would be easier to read information and all reliable. Uh, within Medline, uh, you also have a system where things are linked to other references in other journals. So you can perform uh, an analysis and go through literature and see how it's linked. If a journal said makes a claim, uh, it will give a link to uh, where it has found that information. So this is a very complex and very, very useful source of information. Now, on that note about sites being reliable, this happened last year. You may remember that the US government was in a bit of a funding crisis and uh, the president couldn't uh, get the uh, House of Government to uh, agree on the budget and uh, services start to shut down. It's quite unique, I think, in uh, the modern age. We, and we saw this message last year uh, that there was, a, uh, because of the lack of funding, that the website uh, may not be up to date. Now, we haven't seen it since, but I just thought it was very curious. Uh, we rely on information so much and then something external to it, such as a funding crisis. But to be sure, the government, uh, the, the owners of the site, Medline Plus, had to make absolutely sure to forewarn people that there may be an issue. So in summary, uh, those five areas that we looked at, communication, reference, quality, skills, and healthcare. Remember how, remember my friend Sue, how she's used the internet. Uh, remember why she would have done it to help others and the power that's in that, the support. And also, of course, when somebody comes from that community or a patient comes to you and they ask for information, where do you send them? What information is available? And you need to be able to make quick reference to that and make sure that it's good quality. 
And these three interact very close to each other in daily life for patients and for physicians. Now we haven't really discussed the skills available, but that is something that we'll pick up on over uh, the next few weeks, particularly in the area of how to assess websites. Um, and a patient may ask, how do I know this website is of good value? Well, that's going to be a very different conversation because you'd need to sit down and look at it. But we will talk about how to categorize and make evaluations. And then finally around education, and I think this joins everything up, um, we're all educating each other. The internet is, internet is educating us and us it. So uh, there is a paper in there about IT and medical education. Uh, it just I want you to be aware of how all of these systems uh, have come together to provide, provide us with this rich electronic format. So when you view this lecture, I want you to do uh, the following. Visit both of these websites, both Med and Medline Plus, and focus on Medline Plus them and search both of them for a medical term you know a little about or you've heard about uh, for the first time in lectures. doesn't matter what it was. Uh, I know that you get various lectures, but just pick a healthcare term. Maybe it could be something uh, you've had personal experience of and search both of them uh, to see what kind of results, the quality of the results you get. Medline will be very, very uh, scientific and Medline Plus would be very patient orientated but take a look at these links and try to understand what's going on and give yourself some insight into what's going on. Find uh, a learning resource maybe in Medline Plus or Medline that might help other students studying uh, in the course with you and share your experiences on the uh, discussion forum. I would value your feedback. Not compulsory but if you find something Push it out there and let the class uh, experience it. Finally, uh, I'd like you to watch this video. Uh, this is uh, Dave the Bronckhart. He learned he had a rare and terminal cancer. Uh, and he turned to a group of fellow patients online and found a medical treatment that saved his life. This is his story. Who hasn't, uh, who, who's seen a bad TED talk? Let's put it that way. They're all very, very good. And now what he's saying calls on all patients to talk to one another, know their own health data and make healthcare a better one. Uh, make healthcare better one e-patient at a time. So he's telling patients become an electronic patient. And there it is, the URL, uh, meet e-patient Dave. Uh, you put any of those terms into the TED search, uh, TED website, you'll find them. It's a short video, it is well worth watching. Don't forget to read these papers, as I say, not slavishly, you don't have to know every detail, but you will have to understand the basic principles. Uh, if you haven't tried to sign up for the student uh, BMJ, uh, you can get alerts around uh, healthcare issues that may uh, interest you. Uh, it's, it might inform your reading. Uh, it's a good place to start. Uh, have a look around. Give it some time. Uh, the good thing about the BMJ or the student BMJ, it will send you a weekly email of the information that you're interested in. I know we get a lot of emails, but you know, you're going to have to change or tune into different subjects, so, so give it a go. So thank you for your time, and please post any questions you have on the discussion forum.